Good day. My name is Michael Barber, and I'm an Associate Professor of Instructional Design for the College of Education and Health Science at Troy University, California in Vallejo. The idea of social presence was originally conceived of by Short, Williams, and Christie back in 1976. At the time, they defined it as the degree of awareness that people have of each other during communications. Another way to look at it is the ability for someone to project their own personal characteristics into an interaction that would allow the person that they are interacting with to perceive them as a real person. When it was first conceived of, social presence was based upon two variables, intimacy and immediacy. Intimacy was defined as both the verbal and nonverbal behaviors that an individual would engage in to make them seem inviting to the person that they were communicating with, whereas immediacy was described as the psychological distance or the perceived distance between those involved in the interaction. It is important to keep in mind the fact that when these concepts were first defined, the primary mediums that were being considered were communications in person, on the telephone, through television or radio, or through traditional postal mail. More recently, social presence has been used as one of the three foundational components of the Communities of Inquiry Framework, along with cognitive presence and teaching presence. It is the interaction of these three components that would provide a learner, particularly a learner in a distance or online environment, the ability to fully engage in the educational experience. It is important to note that this idea of interaction is fundamental, not just to the Communities of Inquiry Framework, but to the nature of communication that occurs within social presence theory. When we think about interaction, there are a number of different ways in which we can talk about it. One of the most common to look at is the different types of interaction that may occur in a distance or online learning environment. Michael Moore was the first to describe this when he talked about the fact that the learner interacts with the content, the learner also interacts with the teacher, and finally, the learner interacts with other students. Later, Hillman and their colleagues built upon Moore's original framework by adding the reality that in most online learning environments, the learner also interacts with the interface or the learning management system that they are taking their courses through. More recently, Sutton has added a fifth type of interaction, vicarious interaction, or the interaction that occurs when someone is watching others interact, but does not engage themselves. As online learning incorporates more social media tools, vicarious interaction becomes even more important as individuals lurk on the interactions of others. Teachers need to consider each of these types of interaction to ensure that learners are able to feel social presence throughout all aspects of the online learning experience. For many younger students, understanding all five types of these interactions is especially important as K-12 students do not have the independent learning skills to be able to overcome a lack of social presence in their interactions with the content and the interface. In addition to these types of interactions, teachers also need to be aware of the taxonomy of their interactions. Hyman outlined three different taxonomies or categories for interactions that are particularly useful in the online environment. The first was intellectual or instructional interactions, which were essentially interactions that were related to the course content in some way, shape, or form. The second were organizational or procedural interactions, which were interactions that were focused upon the logistics or processes that come with being a student in an online course. Finally, the third, were social interactions, which were those interactions that were designed to support the student or encourage the student to try to create a connection with the student outside of the course content. As you might imagine, most of the interactions that take place in an online course tend to be instructional or procedural in nature, but it is the social interactions that would allow students to truly see their teachers as real people. Before I conclude, no discussion of social presence within the K-12 online learning environment would be complete without some mention of the Academic Communities of Engagement Framework. This is the first framework that was developed specifically for a K-12 online learning environment by Jared Borup and his colleagues. The idea behind the framework is that in order for students to have academic success, they need to be engaged from a cognitive perspective, a behavioral perspective, and an affective perspective. 
Each individual learner brings certain amounts of independent engagement to any learning context. And that independent engagement that the learner has needs to be supplemented either by supports provided within the course community or supports provided within the learner's personal community. For example, if you had a learner that had a strong personal level of affective engagement, but low levels of cognitive and behavioral engagement, that would mean that there would need to be a higher level of support from the personal community and the course community. As you can see from the example on the screen, in this instance, the majority of that support is being provided by the course community. And there's only a minimal amount of support needed from the student's personal community in order for them to achieve the full engagement that is necessary in order for them to have academic success. So as we think about how we create social presence for K-12 online learners, teachers need to consider how they use the different taxonomies of interaction, as well as the different types of interaction that a learner might engage in to try to maximize the amount of course community support that is provided. This will allow learners to overcome any deficits that they might have in their own independent levels of engagement, as well as deficits in the type of support that may be available within their own personal communities. Some people may think this coverage of social presence and the guidance I've provided for teachers may be a tad bit academic. However, it's important for teachers to understand the potential impact that their own level of intimacy and immediacy can have on a student's sense of social presence. From the interactions that they create for the students with the teacher themselves, with other students, with the content, with the interface that's delivering that content, or the interactions that they simply witness you having with other students and other students having amongst themselves. All of these things can have a significant impact on the student's learning experience and their own sense of social presence. As these are the different components of the course community support that teachers actually have control over, it's important to maximize that support to overcome the fact that some students simply do not have their own independent or sources of community support. Finally, it's also important to ensure that our interactions aren't just instructional or procedural in nature, because it's really the social interactions that are the best way to allow the students to actually see us as real people. 